thank you, Suzanne, for inviting me. It gives me so much pleasure to be back here and see all you people. And Tom was the most amazing mentor ever and um, started me in a very fun and rewarding research career. So I'm so thankful. And Lou and Suzanne were also part of the team and great mentors as well. And I was the mentor for Danielle Burton and Timothy Robertson. So these are sort of your grandparents that I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, it's just a cool thing. Um, this work is joint with Jim Cushing from the University of Arizona and Jim Hayward. Um, just so you'll understand, I also happen to be married to Jim Hayward. And he is a field biologist. He studied uh, seabird systems in the Pacific Northwest for 30 some years. Jim Cushing, uh, as you know, is a mathematician at the University of Arizona. And uh, so air temperatures have been rising, and the scale down here is, this is in millions of years, thousands of years, and years before and after the present. So you can see that over the paleoecological record, uh, we have some reconstructions of temperatures. And then we have some future forecasts for 100 years or so into the future. Um, this graph appeared in Science in 2013, and you can see um, that the uh, projected temperatures are bigger than anything we've seen in the last five million years, and, and so, you know, things are, are happening. <laughs> sea surface temperatures rising. This is, um, let's see, this is uh, for in the last hundred years, roughly speaking. The darker areas are places where sea surface temperature has risen uh, up to four degrees, and this is in Fahrenheit, and then particular off the uh, Pacific Northwest coast of, of North America, um, you see the yellow color, which is one degree, but you may not be able to see that right along the coast and in the in inland waters there of Washington and British Columbia, um, it's more like two degrees. Actually, um, in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Salish Sea area there, uh, temperatures have risen one degree Celsius in the last 30, 40 years. So quite a bit may not sound like much, but when your body temperature goes up a degree, you notice it. Um, of course, the Arctic sea ice uh, has shrunk uh, by about a half uh, since 1984. And obviously, you're going to see a lot of um, uh, effects in the ecosystems. And one clear way to measure some effects are looking at range constrictions, uh, up mountains, and so forth. What I want to talk to you about today, though, are changes in, in animal behavior uh, due to climate change, particular changes in reproductive behaviors and in feeding behaviors. And this is kind of a famous uh, picture of a, a polar bear cannibalizing a young polar bear. Um, presumably, such incidents have, crease, have increased because there's less ice pack from which the bears can fish for seals. And that ties in a little bit with what I'll be talking about as well. So in the Pacific Northwest, we do have this uh, climbing trend. The black curve is the trend that we've mentioned. But of course, we also have these short-term cycles uh, that are called INSO cycles, or El Nino Southern Oscillation, on the order of more like 10 years. Um, which, so we have the short-term fluctuations around a long-term trend, which raises an interesting question of whether effects of short-term high sea surface temperatures during El Nino years can tell you anything about what might happen in the near future when uh, the average rises to those levels. And so uh, we've written a paper on that in marine ornithology, and I won't say much more about it except to say that the answer is complicated, but sometimes probably we can um, illuminate long-term effects by looking at these short-term highs. So a general question is the following. Um, as climate changes, animal behavior changes. And uh, typically, that's on a scale that is different from the scale of the population dynamics. So um, for example, feeding and uh, reproductive behaviors within a reproductive season in, the, in, in terms of seabirds, for example, is on a different time scale than the population dynamics, which goes across breeding seasons. So the modeling problem is, uh, how can we predict the effects of changes in, let's say, daily behavior on daily time scales on population dynamics? So we have uh, changes in climate that drive changes in 
animal behaviors in feeding and reproduction which drive um, changes in population dynamics. Now, to set up the ideas for the modeling, let me give you the example of the system we work with. In the Salish Sea, I'll explain where the Salish Sea is in a moment, we look at seabirds, and uh, here is the Pacific Northwest, and the Salish Sea is there. Uh, it's the inland waters, uh, marine waters of Washington and British Columbia, east of Vancouver Island there. Um, so there's an island there called Protection Island. It's a national wildlife refuge established uh, during the tenure of President Ronald Reagan. And it, it hosts about 70% actually of the breeding seabirds in the Salish Sea region. And there are about 70,000 nesting seabirds there. So we, the biggest numbers uh, are rhinoceros auklets. Uh, we have glaucous wing gulls, uh, tufted puffin, black oyster catchers, uh, and so on. It's a wonderful place, closed to the public. Jim, uh, Jim Hayward has been working there for over 30 years. So he has very long data sets. This is what the island looks like. It's a high plateau, about 100 feet high, um, kind of like a layered birthday cake. The geology is gorgeous. It's glacial uh, geology. And then you have these two gravel spits at the end of the island, and those uh, provide uh, seal rookery space and also um, uh, room for seabird colonies. There's a large glaucous wing colony here of about uh, 2,500 um, nesting pairs. The uh, cliffs are interesting. They're about 100 feet high and they're riddled like Swiss cheese with rhinoceros auklet burrows. Now, why would anybody study gulls? Just like why would anybody study flower beetles, right? Well, because <laughs> they're not going to go extinct anytime soon and they bug people, you know. Well, besides being a beautiful animal, they are the traditional animal model for animal behavior studies, okay? They have very interesting repertoire of behaviors. Um, also, they're considered sentinels of climate change in the Salish Sea region because they're quite sensitive to changes in the environment. So Danielle's worked out on this island. I just thought about that, right? How many years? One, two seasons, right. It's a neat place to work. We started a, a long-term empirical study in 2006 to study reproductive success because we thought there were some bad things happening. So we started looking carefully at it. So on this island, there are no ground predators, okay? The only predation uh, is basically due to eagles and egg cannibalism. So the eagles eat eggs, chicks, and adults, and Conspecific gulls eat their neighbors' eggs and sometimes chicks. This is, these are the main sources of egg loss. And what we've learned is that years of high sea surface temperature, that would be El Nino years usually, are associated with high egg cannibalism. There's always some egg cannibalism, but there's a dramatic increase. In fact, a tenth of a degree increase in sea surface temperature is associated with a 10% increase in, an odd, in the odds that an egg is cannibalized. Okay, so you see this high uh, rate of egg cannibalism, and also in those same years, you see an interesting phenomenon, interesting especially for a mathematician, of an egg-laying synchrony. Now, it's not just the yearly synchrony that you think about with seabirds, but it's an every other day egg-laying synchrony, which I'll explain in a moment. So these are two behavioral changes that we see when sea surface temperature is high. Uh, why egg cannibalism? That's not very hard to answer because when sea surface temperature is high, the plant plankton and feeder fish drop to lower levels in the water column where it's cooler, and these birds can't get to their food, and they're hungry, they're starving, and uh, it so happens that one neighbor's egg will supply half the calories needed uh, for an adult gull in one day. Easy, nutritious food source. Why? egg-laying synchrony when sea surface temperature is high. Well, to explain that, I have to give you a little bit of the physiology. So, um, gull female ovulation cycles are sort of analogous to humans, but they're two days long instead of 28 days long. But analogously, halfway through the cycle, there's a, a surge in luteinizing hormone. 
Uh, immediately after which, the most mature follicle is uh, sent into the oviduct, so that's the ovulation. And then two days later, uh, right after the next LH surge, there's another ovulation and that previous egg is laid in the nest. And this happens on an average of three times for an individual bird. And so on average, an, a, a specific nest will have three eggs. So um, you can think of this, a mathematician would think of this as a population of oscillators that are kind of ephemeral. They pop in and out of existence. They pop into existence at different times at the beginning of the breeding season, and they oscillate three times and then they wink out of existence. Um, turns out that such a population, if there are 50, around 50 or more oscillators, can synchronize. And um, possibly what happens is that the LH surges synchronize. Each of these would be uh, the ov three ovulation cycles for one individual bird, starting at different times, but if the hormonal cycles were, uh, were synchronized, notice that you get egg, this is the total number of eggs laid that day. The total number of eggs laid that day is a two cycle where every other day you drop ideally to zero. So this is the every other day egg laying synchrony that we observe. Now normally on years when sea surface temperature is not high, you just get a big dumping of eggs that lasts about two weeks, well, three or four if you look, you know, but most of the eggs are dumped in about two weeks. And this is your yearly number of eggs laid per day, looks like that. But in these special years of high sea surface temperature, this egg laying season widens out quite a bit, okay? And uh, inside this yearly envelope, you have this higher frequency oscillation that develops, which is this egg laying synchrony. So that's kind of interesting for a mathematician. Now, Biologist is interested in this because it's thought that um, this kind of yearly annual reproductive pulse is adaptive due to something called the Fraser-Darling effect. And that's the hypothesis that um, if you lay your eggs when everybody else does, each egg has less chance of getting taken because of predator satiation, okay? Well, here, notice that, well, that's about that would protect against, say, eagles. Here, you're not protecting as much against eagle predation because you're actually, your, your uh, annual pulse is spread out. But now you have this every other day synchrony inside this annual pulse. And the reason that's protective is protective against conspecific predation, cannibalism. And the reason is that the cannibals take the first leg, egg laid in the nest. They take the first egg laid in the nest, so, so, uh, and they do it within the first 24 hours, typically. And there's a reason for this. The parents are not nearly as invested in the territory at that point, and they don't guard it very well. As Soon as there are two eggs in the nest, the parents guard it extremely closely. So, um, so the idea is, is that you wanna lay your egg, your first egg, on the same day that a lot of other people lay their first egg. And that's gonna be protective against cannibalism. But there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off between uh, which type of predation you're protecting against. Uh, of course, actual data are always messy. This is a actual data time series. And if you wanna ask me how we show statistically that this is significantly synchronous, I can explain that later, but that's not the main point of the talk. You have to do it carefully with Monte Carlo simulations. All right, so let me sort of summarize the biological aspect here. There are these small changes in sea surface temperature. Um, and when you have a cooler sea, there's abundant food for these seabirds, low egg cannibalism. There is a tight annual reproductive pulse. So high yearly synchrony, usually no daily synchrony. Actually never, we've never seen over, over all these years daily synchrony when we had the cooler sea. Uh, then there are years, El Nino years of warmer sea surface temperature when food is scarce, there's high egg cannibalism. And in those years, um, the egg laying season is longer and within that egg-laying pulse, we have um, 
this every other day egg laying synchrony. So you have lower yearly synchrony, but high daily synchrony in that case. So there are three interesting things about this. First of all, this behavioral plasticity, the ability to switch between these two feeding tactics based on what this year's, the previous fall's temp sea surface temperature is, is behavioral plasticity that is adaptive for these ENSO cycles, okay? And a second thing that's interesting is that if it were to be a bad year every year, this tactic is not sustainable because um, it turns out that the cannibals have zero reproductive success. So this tactic is good as a lifeboat phenomenon to get you through a bad year and you know, so that you can reproduce in a good year, but it would be probably disastrous as a long-term strategy. The last thing that's really interesting here is what I mentioned before, that these two tactics for, for reproductive uh, synchrony uh, have a trade-off. The, the upper one is more protective for external predation, and the lower one is more protective for conspecific predation. Yeah. No, it's, it's always their neighbor's eggs. Or, you know, when I say neighbor, it could be quite a, way, a ways away. But uh, the only time they eat their own eggs is if one accidentally cracks or something, they will go ahead and eat the contents. Yeah. Um, so, so back to this idea of a change in climate, and I'm thinking particularly of sea surface temperature, um, giving rise to changes in these behaviors and how that might affect population dynamics on a bigger time scale um, was addressed in a recent paper that we did in JMB and we set up a general class of discrete time models. So I'm going to go through the general theory, mathematical theory, um, and then after that, and I, I won't spend a lot of time on the details, they're, they're in this paper, it's actually kind of a detailed paper to read actually. But, you can look at them in there, but uh, I'll spend the rest of the time looking at a particular application to this seabird system. So um, let's look at a discrete time matrix model there at the top. And uh, here X is a population vector of, of uh, stage classes, and P is a projection matrix that takes you from one population vector to the next. And what I want to emphasize here is that the time step is short. So it's something like on the order of one day. So this is on the order of the behavioral changes, okay? So think of this as happening fast, like every day. And the projection matrix is actually uh, periodically forced. It's two different uh, matrices within the breeding season. So if the breeding season is K days long, say, um, then the projection matrix is some uh, typical, well, it's not typical because it, this is actually an animal behavior model within the breeding season, and that the projection matrix is called W. And then when you get to the end of the breeding season, t uh, day K minus one, say, um, you assess an overwinter mortality, and you reassign, you redistribute all the individuals to the adult age classes and then you start the next breeding season. So that's the idea. So it's a periodically forced system. And A has a special form in this class of models. So it, A is a matrix that um, has the following column vector called A hat. So the new one, new two up to new M are survivorships. They are survivorships for each class for overwintering. And then this A hat is a column vector whose entries sum to one. And the entries describe how, at the end of the breeding season, these individuals are reassigned to the classes at the beginning of the next breeding season. Okay? And it will be very clear, I think, when I show you the example, what kinds of uh, things we would choose for A. 
So here's what happens, right? Within the breeding season, on a time step of one, you keep iterating the map, okay? And when you get to the end of the breeding season, you uh, hit it with matrix A, which takes you to the beginning of the next breeding season. It does t A does two things, remember. It assesses an overwinter mortality, and it redistributes the individuals in the classes. Okay, um, interestingly enough, the population vector at the beginning of the next season is still a multiple of this A hat vector, okay? And so, uh, for asymptotic dynamics, we can assume without loss of generality that we start with such a initial population vector that's um, in the proportions of A hat, and then, um, let's see here, did I advance? Yes. Um, and so what we can do, see, is replace these initial vectors here with a multiple of A hat. And then down here, um, we can replace the product of the daily time scale projection matrices uh, with, we'll call that Q, it depends on alpha because each uh, population vector depends on alpha. And that is all uh, multiplied by a hat. And so, without going into too much detail, what I want you to understand is that from the beginning of a period, or a season that is, to the beginning of the next season, we're really looking at a composite map that takes a um, multiple of that a hat vector a hat vector to another multiple of the a hat vector. And um, so the interesting, so let's look right here. There's another way of saying that. If you think about the multiple in front of a hat as being a, uh, so those are scalars. Those are what's driving the dynamics, and you're actually looking at a scalar map. Okay. So this m-dimensional system, uh, because of the special construction of the matrix A, turns into a scalar map. Okay, so um, let's see. Without doing too many, uh, the notation is, is kind of annoying here. Without doing too many details, uh, here's the scalar map, and note that um, the alphas are actually, they turn out to be the total population size at the beginning of each breeding season. So really you have a scalar map that uh, accounts for the dynamics of the total population size. All right. Um, so then you can actually relate the projection function R to your within season uh, behavior matrix and your across season matrix um, and define new hat to be the row vectors of the survivorships. And you can actually, all I'm trying to show you here, you, you can actually get a formula for R. Um, of course, it depends on the particular application and it can be quite horrible, okay? So, um, uh, let's see, let me go to the next slide. So a basic question is, what about this scalar map? Well, is the extinction equilibrium stable or is it unstable? We're interested about that. And of course, if R of zero is less than one, we'll get stability for extinction. If R of zero is greater than one, we'll get instability. And again, you can actually calculate R of zero. It's a horrible calculation if K is very big. Uh, but that can be done. And in general, we're actually interested in, remember, the effect of an environmental parameter on this whole system, on the behaviors and on the population level consequences. So we can take a convenient parameter, P, think of it, oh, it could be sea surface temperature. And each entry in the within season behavioral matrix, uh, projection matrix, can depend on that parameter. And then in our 
uh, reduced system, which is this scalar map. Um, R would be a function of P as well. And typically, for these applications we're interested in, there will be a critical value P0 of the parameter at which R increases through 1. Okay, so typically you have that. And what happens uh, when the zero state goes from unstable to stable is typically you get a branch of equilibria coming off in a bifurcation. And so what you want to do if you're gra graphing a bifurcation diagram is graph uh, the, the equation 1 equals R of P. Okay, and that branch of equilibria will correspond to K cycles of the original structured population model. So that's the main idea. So your branch could look like this or this. And here's the critical value of the environmental parameter. So here's your branch of non-trivial K cycles bifurcating off, and something we're interested in usually is whether it's a um, subcritical or a critical bifurcation, so, or is it a bifurcation to the right, or is it a bifurcation to the left? Um, the reason we're interested in that is typically, remember that the zero state, the extinction state, goes from stable to unstable at P naught, and if you get a forward bifurcation, those are going to be stable close to the bifurcation point. If you get a backward bifurcation, those will be unstable close to the bifurcation point. So you're stable here, unstable here. And then typically, um, negative feedbacks will finally overcome. And you'll get a stable branch. It turns around. You'll get a st stable branch coming back to the right. And this is very interesting for two reasons when you get this configuration. The first reason is, is you get what's called a strong Ali effect because there is this threshold, this unstable threshold here, below which the population goes extinct, but above which uh, it persists to the stable branch right here. Um, so when you have a strong Ali effect, you have this whole region here uh, of, of poor quality environment, okay, when P is smaller than P0. Uh, for which your population can survive at environments that are degraded enough so that without whatever mechanism is causing this backward bifurcation, they could not survive in that region. That was a very convoluted sentence, I'm sorry. All right. So, um, so to say it more simply, if you have, if P, the, the parameter of interest, the bifurcation parameter, is some environmental thing like sea surface temperature, um, and it gives rise to a behavior like, say, cannibalism, and if cannibalism has sufficient positive feedback for the system, that this branch turns, uh, is backward and then turns around, um, it's saying that not only is that there are this a Lee range, this Ali effect range, where the population can persist at values uh, for which it would not without the cannibalism, but um, also there's a tipping point. Okay, and if the, and if the environment is degraded uh, below that tipping point, everything will collapse in a blue sky bifurcation. All right, so that's kind of the things you look for in these sorts of models. Um, and the way, the calculation that allows you to tell the, the, the direction of the bifurcation is a compendium of derivatives of the entries of that within season projection matrix. So you look at all the entries of that matrix, you take derivatives, um, there's this compendium where there are linear combinations of those, and if that compendium has a net negative value, you get the forward bifurcation. And if the compendium has a net positive value, you get the backward bifurcation. So things like cannibalism that can cause positive feedbacks in the system, um, you, you might expect they can give a bi backward bifurcation. Okay. So that's kind of... Uh, now, these um, quantities are, let's just say, a bother to compute. Okay. <laughs> so this is just, uh, again, summarizing that 
you can get hysteresis and you can get the strong ali effects and you can get, I'm very interested in tipping points, when the environment is degraded so much that um, the whole population collapses in a blue sky bifurcation. All right, so let me summarize what I just said about this general class of models. And then let's look at a specific model for this system. Okay, so these uh, models were motivated by populations where feeding and reproductive behaviors occur during a breeding season, so on a shorter time scale, but the maturation is occurring across breeding seasons. Okay. And uh, this class of models permits an analysis of these seasonal cycles and their stability as they depend on, of course, inherent vital rates, but also within season nonlinear behaviors which can be affected, right, by these environmental parameters. And also, you can study these uh, as a function of the length of the breeding season, which is K. You can study it as a function of K. Um, so, big bold print. We can study ALE effects and tipping points as functions of within season behaviors as they depend on environmental parameters such as sea surface temperature. So it links all these ideas together. All right, let's look at an application of this model to the seabird colony. Now this is, um, one of the students and I were talking today about how mathematical models are um, typically proof of concept models and, and you know, they're not as complicated hopefully as the original system. Some of the simplifications in this model are gonna be that we're gonna, we're gonna assume that individual birds mature after one year. Actually, these birds mature after four years. So that's the main biological simplification uh, in this model. And there are a couple others, but actually, other than that, it's pretty true to the biological mechanisms as we understand them. So let's look at the within-season modeling first. So the time step is one day. And within the season, let's look at four classes of, of individuals. So we have first-day juveniles. Those would be the first-day eggs. Um, they have their own class, and the reason is those are the ones that get cannibalized, right? Then we have older eggs and juveniles. We have reproducing adults and non-reproducing adults, and they just switch back and forth every day. What does that mean? Well, this is the ovulation cycle. So they lay an egg on this day, they don't on this day, and so forth, okay? Um, so reproducing adults give rise to eggs, um, Eggs give rise to the older eggs and juveniles, and then these just collect during the breeding season. They're being incubated, they collect in here. And then at the end of the season, um, all these classes are gonna get dumped into the adult classes. So first uh, day eggs are going to be, they'll be assessed by a survivorship overwintering, but then they get divided into these two adult classes. Older juveniles the same and the non-reproductive adults are reassigned as well. And so um, I'll show you the, the matrices in a moment. There they are. So the projection matrix is periodically forced. This is a four by four system. Within season matrix, the across season matrix, here are the categories, the classes, day old eggs, older eggs and juveniles. Uh, first day of ovulation cycle, second day of ovulation cycle. Um, Let's look at the across season matrix first and then we'll look at the within season. The across season matrix has these class specific survivorships, new one, new two, new three, new four, for overwintering. But the thing I want you to focus on is how they're split uh, between the two adult classes at the beginning of the next breeding season. So that this zero, zero, new, one minus new is your A hat matrix that we talked about. That, whose entry sum to one. And uh, uh, the within season matrix is sort of a, in some ways a typical kind of matrix. You have a birth rate here. It depends, all these entries depend on rho, which is the resource level, uh, which is a proxy for um, low sea surface temperature, okay? So when sea surface temperature is low, resource is high and vice versa. But it's a proxy for sea surface temperature. And then you have 
Now this class, the second class, is the older eggs and juveniles. So you have older eggs coming from first day eggs, uh, the ones that don't get cannibalized, okay? And then you have uh, older eggs accumulating in their own class over the breeding season. And then uh, reproducing adults come from non-reproducing adults each day. They switch back and forth. Non-reproducing adults come from reproducing adults, but there's also some of the non-reproducers that stay in the class for a day. And I'll show you the mechanisms here in a minute, but it has to do with synchronization. So there's, we built a synchronization a tendency into the model, and so at each time step, a non-reproducer can decide either to go back to the reproducing class or to wait a day in order to synchronize with everybody else. So it's a propensity to synchronize. Uh, but I'll get real specific there in a moment. All right, so the, the uh, birth rate is the usual thing. I mean, you've got an inherent birth rate that depends on, uh, uh, not sea surface temperature, but resource level proxy for sea surface temperature. And then it's discounted by some um, function, crowding effect, effects of um, some weighted, weighted value of the total population size. Um, the first day eggs that become, you know, older eggs and juveniles, they have some survivorship, but then the ones that make it are the ones that are not cannibalized by class three and not, and not cannibalized by class four. So that's what those um, factors are, the ones that escape cannibalization. So again, we have a negative effect of cannibalization, okay? Uh, this class is just a straight up survivorship from one day to the next, uh, that entry. This entry, um, so these are the ones coming from the reproducing adults into the non-reproducing adults. And here we have a survivorship for the day, but also we have a function, sigma, that is a function of um, the number of eggs that an individual adult can cannibalize. And this is an increasing function of its argument. So here you see a positive effect of cannibalization. So in other words, cannibalizing increases um, the adult's survivorship. Okay. You have to rig those functions correctly so they don't exceed one and stuff. But. So there's your first positive effect of cannibalization. There's another one here, same sort of thing. Now G is this propensity to start oscillating, uh, start synchronizing, excuse me, to synchronize the adult classes. And uh, typically, um, G of, so G of zero is one. It's the, G is the probability, stands for the probability um, that uh, an animal, that one of the adults in its class will uh, move to the next class as opposed to staying in that class and waiting to synchronize, okay? And then, here we have the one minus G. We have a similar formulation, but we have the one minus G. All right, so each of those functions has particular functional forms, um, you know, hopefully more or less based on the biology as we understand it. Oh, Gordon. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, you said that it's usually just the first egg that's cannibalized. Almost always. So you have then lots of birds raising two eggs, that's just three. Yes. And Very possibly, and there's also the question, will that second one, which is now sort of the first one in the nest, will that one be treated like a first egg? It, you know, so there are all these questions that surround that. So um, some of the projects our students are working on um, right now are collect, is collecting data about those very questions. Right, exactly. Yeah, because when we do the egg count daily, um, we know, as Danielle can well tell you, uh, we know um, the eggs are all marked, so we know whether it's the first, second, or third egg, or a fourth egg that was put in, or a fifth egg sometimes. And yeah. Uh-huh. 
And we don't know all those, the answers to all those questions yet, though. Okay, when you put in specific functional forms that correspond to the biology as we understand it right now, you can get backward bifurcations. That's the main point of this talk. They can be caused by cannibalism with no synchrony. They can be caused by synchrony with no cannibalism or a mixture of the two. Um, that's because we built in a positive effect of cannibalism into the model. So you can get this backward bifurcation sometimes. And as far as egg laying synchrony goes, um, the sort of predator satiation is basically built into the model. And so uh, you get a positive effect. If, if the breeding season is long enough, you can get a positive effect due to this egg laying synchrony. Um, so both of these mechanisms, these behavioral mechanisms can lead to strong allele effects. So the population can persist at resource levels below which it would otherwise go extinct. And you can translate this into sea surface temperature. St population can persist at sea surface temperatures that are higher than those for which it would otherwise go extinct. Um, and along with that, you get these tipping points so that if the environment is sufficiently degraded, um, the population can disappear in one of these blue sky bifurcations. It's kind of the um, price you pay for a strong allele effect, is the possibility of a tipping point. So some punchlines with which I want to leave you. Uh, these are the things that I think are most interesting. So this has been a long span of work with tons of papers, but here are some of the things I think are most interesting so far. So the environmental variability in the Pacific Northwest, I'm talking about ENSO cycles, uh, can lead to or have led to this behavioral plasticity. That is the ability of these organisms to abruptly change their behavioral tactics in feeding and reproduction based on what the sea surface temperature was last October. Turns out that that's what's important, what the sea surface temperature was last October. Has to do with herring, um, reproduction and you know things like that. So therefore, environmental changes can alter feeding and reproductive behaviors abruptly. That's because it's already built in. The ability to choose these tactics is already built in. They've been there before. Okay. Um, bad deer behaviors, such as I'm thinking of cannibalism can act as lifeboat mechanisms. I mean, they're adaptive for these short-term cycles, probably because they're lifeboat mechanisms that get you from a bad year back to a good year. But these uh, mechanisms not only lead to the possibility of a Lee effects, which you can think of as a good thing, but also to the possibility of, of, of tipping points or blue sky bifurcations. And Bad year behaviors may not actually be sustainable if every year is a bad year. So um, I forget if I mentioned to you, but the cannibals have basically zero reproductive success. We've never found any chicks from a cannibal territory, any surviving chicks. Did you ever find? I don't think we've ever found surviving chicks from a cannibal territory. I mean, they're out cannibalizing when they should be guarding their nest. <laughs> yeah. Sociopaths. <laughs> so um, they may not be sustainable in the long run. And what does that mean if bad years are sustained year after year after year after year? Well, one thing it could mean is that because there is a tipping point uh, built into this bifurcation diagram, right, by this plasticity, um, you could get a colony collapse through one of those tipping points if you had uh, environmental degradation every year, you know, for 10 years or something. That's just a guess as far as the number of years it would take, but, but uh, that's the main idea. So um, we've been very thankful to National Science Foundation, very, very thankful to be funded since 2003 on this project. And um, Andrews University also provides a lot of funding for which we're very thankful. And the team, of course, the team 
is made up of us three individuals, but there are other scientists involved, a lot of spin-off projects, and tons of students, graduate students and undergraduate students, um, for which National Science Foundation has generally, generously provided their funding. And Fish and Wildlife Service has been great for letting us work on a closed island all these years, and then our logistics happen at, at a marine lab on, in Anacortes called Rosario Beach Marine Lab. And that's all, thank you. and Mike is here, so. Really nice talk. Thanks. Ooh, that was very close. Um, so I had a question about, hmm. <laughs> this is interesting. All right, the synchronization behavior. Yeah. So you said that the, you know that it is correlated with these, um, um, temperature rises. Yeah. Do you know anything deeper, like the mechanism for the it? Mechanism. Um, if it's conditional dependent, do they are they looking at others? Is there, is there a social component to yeah. cannibalism? That's a really good question. So, what my my understanding of your question is: what is the actual mechanism that leads to the synchronization? That's a huge question. I think we're about to solve it. Um, so, you know, some of the things we thought about at first were, um, you know, pheromones or behaviors that synchronize spatially and various things. Um, but it, it seems that, um, so gulls have this really raucous, loud, <laughs> obvious um, copulation behavior where the male jumps on top of the female and then makes this very loud, raucous call and flaps wings. I mean, there's, you know, nothing private about this. And, um, turns out we've shown that those um, synchronize in time, so that's a socially facilitated behavior, um, which might make you suspect it would lead to egg-laying synchrony, but we don't actually know the physiology about whether these birds um, store sperm and how long it takes to lay an egg afterwards. But one thing we did show recently was that um, <laughs> how to say this delicately, but I mean, birds um, don't lay eggs the same day they copulate. They don't feel like it or something. And so, you know, and so um, you can kind of see there might be a mechanism there for if you're synchronizing the copulations and maybe if they were ready to lay an egg today, but they copulate today, they put the egg off until tomorrow, you can sort of see that there might be a synchronized. That's as close as I can get right now to answering your question. Yeah. You know, there was this whole thing about women synchronizing in dormitories. Mm -hmm. It was a huge thing. It was in science. It was actually an undergraduate research project that got published in science. And then it became very controversial. Um, did you study that? Yeah. It, it, was, it turned out that the methodology was flawed, very flawed. Yes, it was flawed. And so uh, we can't really categorically say that that's the case for women in a dormitory, although women who've lived in a dormitory believe in it. But, you know, <laughs> it's not. The, let me just say the methodological flaws well, in that. She was. <laughs> Remember that for your trivia. <laughs> 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 and that's why she didn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, the methodological flaws in that study just say, it doesn't say that women don't synchronize in a dorm. It just says that we still don't know, basically. So I don't really know um, whether other species do that, but there's some indication that they might, yeah. So in, in the case of the women, what, what Bar uh, McClintock, not Barbara, but what was it? Huh? Marty. McClint McClint yeah, what she did was is she took uh, um, Q-tips, and I think she took perspiration from under the arm and put it above the lip. That's what she did to try to synchronize. Yeah, that's an interesting paper if you go back and look at it. <laughs> other, other questions? Uh, so there's this um, effect of the seabirds, but you also talked about the secondary predation from eagles. Yeah. Have you looked at whether their behavior changes with rising SST? 
Not specifically, but um, I can tell you a couple things about eagles. We just have an eagle paper um, that we're revising right now for ecology and evolution that's, that's interesting. Um, so one thing we know is that eagle populations have recovered in the Pacific Northwest, Northwest since DDT was banned. Yeah. They've recovered in this- Golden eagles or bald eagles? Bald, okay. bald, so, yeah. in this gorgeous logistic curve uh, mm -hmm. they've recovered. Um, R squared, if you fit, if you fit a logistic to it, you know, you get R squared of 0.98 or something. It's just amazing <laughs> for an ecologist, right? So you gotta use that as an example. Yeah. And we'll be publishing those data, so you can use it as soon as that comes out. Um, and you were asking about eagles. Oh, the other thing about eagles is that apparently fish stocks are way down. I'm not a fish person, but apparently they're way down. And so uh, people think that uh, bald eagles are, you know, s prey switching a lot, and they're, it's a big hit on the seabirds, huge. So if you read this little paper we did, we actually uh, looked at a, you know, your classic, not the classic lock of Altera predator prey model, because you know, that doesn't have self-limitation rates and sw prey switching and stuff in it, but alternate prey and so forth in it. But uh, if you just put in the obvious modifications, it fits with an R square of like 0.9. Fits, uh, fits what? It fits the eagle data uh, and the data for the population data for these gulls on Protection Island. And it's very convincing that the huge decline you know, that we've seen in these animals is due to, um, there's a huge decline that's due to eagle predation. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, how sea surface temperatures feeding into all that, but there's, uh, there's that component of it that's very clearly due to bald eagles. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you look at those, you put those data together for the eagle population data and the gull population data that we've collected from this island over the last 30 years, and you see this gorgeous predator prey cycle. It's amazing. You know, you can fit the classic lock of Altera predator prey to it, but you know it's not right because gulls are not the only thing eagles eat. And if the gulls went extinct, the eagles would do fine. So, <laughs> so yeah, but uh, anyway, it's interesting. Um, earlier, you were talking about how the breeding window can be tighter or yeah. broader. Mm -hmm. So I was curious about how you vary K. Um, in, in your model? We haven't, yeah, so at this stage, um, really the only thing we've done with this model so far is to just do the theory, and that's that JMB paper, mm -hmm. but we have not really started looking at how all these phenomena depend on K, so K could be made to vary, but then you couldn't reduce it to a <laughs> scalar map, and you know, so there's some issues, but yeah. And also, uh, of course, of interest is to make rho, which is basically a proxy for sea surface temperature, um, to make that periodic and then stochastic. So these are all future directions for many grad students and Jim Cushing's postdocs, and, <laughs> and it'll keep him going for a long time as far as <laughs> postdoc work. <laughs> yes, please. I guess this is connected. So <coughs> the rho, you said you were gonna make it, you were thinking about making it periodic or stochastic? The row, yeah. The row. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that there's a feedback, that do the, do the um, does the biology regulate the, can it regulate the, because you said that sea surface temperature influences the amount of plankton that's in the, that's in the, in the water and the depth that, that the plankton grow right. and that's the, the food availability. Does right. your model, I don't think your model has a, has a feedback between the. No, it doesn't. Do you think that would be something that would be of interest or? Well. On an ecosystem level, yeah. it might be. I uh, mean, I think at the level of the gull population, there's probably minuscule feedback there. But okay. at an ecosystem level, you know, I'd think you'd be right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right now, we're treating rho as a constant. Yeah. Yeah. Two sort of slightly, I won't say they're off topic, but they're sort of related. Uh, your <laughs> island that you uh, are the working on, you mentioned how that were those low, shallow shelves. Yeah. Now, so would climate change and sea level rise endanger those? And mm -hmm. Has that been in, put into the uh, equation in any way? No, 
No, that's uh, yeah, that's a whole other story. It would be, um, but those are pretty low. Um, yeah, they look get, pretty low from the photograph. They are. They get up to maybe, um, you know, two meters above sea level, <coughs> above the high water level. Yeah. Um, I want to show you something about that, Gordon. You can you can see that that this island looks like a daphnid. <laughs> when you look at it in the air. And this is really meaningful to me on sort of a mystical level because <laughs> when I came out of, Lou was talking about how Tom converted me. When, he didn't tell you I was converted out of mathematical uh, logic, but when I was converted into mathematical biology, my first work was with Daphnia, of course. We yeah. were a Daphnia group. And so when I started Seabirds, it was naturally drawn to this <laughs> Daphnid type island. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> well, you were going to say something. Yeah, else. the second uh, question was uh, people doing the type of work that you're doing. A lot of animals, of course, have very wide geographic ranges. Yeah, snakes these do. I work garter snakes. They go from middle Florida all the way into Canada and way yeah, up. Yeah. So can you get lessons from animals at certain latitudes and so on that can help you predict what's going to happen or could happen? Oh, I think and so. And how they would uh, maybe adapt. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, this population, as in this colony on this island, will most likely disappear, but these animals are going to move north. And, you're, no, you're exactly right, although I haven't done that kind of work. There's some really neat work out there based on latitude. But these animals um, basically uh, breed all along the coast from about here all the way up. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. yes. One more. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that um, there's sort of an absence of reproductive success uh, yeah, for in the, the populations given. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm assuming, depending on the, uh, the population and their access to resources, is uh, the determining factor for the propensity to cannibalize. How much individual variation in the, is there within the population? Uh, in terms that's of a really good question, too. Um, so these are spot on questions. Um, so it turns out, and I didn't say this, but it turns out that. There's a huge variation among individuals. So there are these birds that specialize. I said something about sociopath. There are birds that specialize in cannibals. We call in cannibalism, we call them super cannibals. So yeah, basically all the, it's always the males. All the males will cannibalize, but um, there are these super cannibals that'll take 16 eggs a day. You can tell because they take it back to their territory. So we can count the number of eggs taken per day. We have a, a really good, um, we know what's going on in the system. We can count everything. And uh, so these super cannibals have zero reproductive success. Um, do, you, do you know sort of what accounts for that um, individual variation in behavior? No. Cool. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in flower beetles, which are also cannibals. <laughs> it's, it's a theme here. <laughs> Flower beetles, um, you know, the, the propensity to cannibalize is genetically controlled. Um, you know, I think a lot of these behaviors are genetically co controlled to some degree, and they're adaptive uh, behaviors. But, um, you know, in the flower beetles, you can select for cannibalism propensity, and you can have these super cannibalistic tribolium strains, and you can have ones that basically don't cannibalize at all. So, but I, I don't know, you know, other than the fact that with these short-term cycles, it ought to select for the plasticity for these behaviors, and it would be an advantage. These behaviors would be an advantage over the short run, um, but not over the long run. I mean, that's, I don't know how to account for it other than that kind of story. Yeah. Sort of sanctioning behaviors? Sanctioning behaviors? Not that we know of. No. But uh, yeah, these are some, some amazing birds. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, Atma, one more. Uh, uh, I'm a little confused about why uh, the cannibals have, why you, why you say that the cannibals have zero reproductive success. Uh, given, so if they have zero reproductive success, are they maintained by some sort of bed hedging? Or, uh, so are they maintained by bed hedging? Or so are they what? I'm sorry? So if the cannibals have zero reproductive yes. success, why are they still around? 
why is why is that trait still in the population? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so these these super cannibals in good years don't do the super cannibal thing. Okay. So you can imagine that this behavior could be adaptive for these short-term fluctuations in environment because it gets you through some bad years and back to a good year. And it allows, it gives you a better survivorship if okay, you cannibalize. So, uh, my, my other question, okay. related question is uh -huh. that, so when you showed the strong LE effect, you said that uh, the strong LE effect happens when you have the cannibalism, the plasticity. That's right, guy. that's right. So, uh, so you do have a, you do have the non-extinction non stable you do, size. yeah. So, uh, so that maintains the population size. So I don't see why that means reproductive success. Is. So you, when you mean reproductive, so I mean of individuals. So if okay, you watch okay. the cannibals, sorry about switching individual and population scale all the time, but if if you watch the individual nests that belong to these super cannibals, they never put out any chicks. Okay, and in, in the bad years when they're doing this behavior, and then you you know you eventually get back to non uh, to La Nina years when when it's good years, and they don't do the cannibalism in those years, and they do put off chicks. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, Shondell. Let's let's thank her again for this great talk. <laughs> <laughs>